Welcome to Stories After Midnight. Today we'll be reading a story called, It's Day 6 of what was supposed to be Winter Camp in Iceland. My friends are dead, and I don't feel cold anymore. By Trash Tia. I really hope you enjoy it, and a huge shout out to my patrons for helping make this episode possible. Let's get started. So, there's a device here which perfectly translates speech to text. I'm currently sitting in a freezer. It's the safest place here and I don't think I'll be caught. There's a whole load of computers and old laptops just like in the main lab, but this thing can turn my voice into words. Okay, so, I'm not cold anymore. I should feel this place, the deathly temperature enveloping me, but I can't feel it. I wish I was cold. It was supposed to be a youth retreat. Mom thought it was the perfect vacation, a trip to Iceland during the holidays. I've never been abroad before, so this was a chance to branch out and actually go somewhere with my life. Mom didn't mean to, but she was unintentionally smothering me. I'm 18 years old, and I was yet to leave the confines of our tiny little town. The brochure and website looked promising, described as once-in-a-lifetime getaway to northern Iceland, the more remote parts away from the bustling city of Reykjavik, and the temptation of tourist spots like the Blue Lagoon. It was a modern, toasty cabin in the middle of nowhere, a youth center specifically built for lost kids trying to find themselves. They really hammered that in with every page. It was impossible not to get lost in the idea of strangers turned soulmates. The brochure's front cover was a photo of the cabin at night, lit up in cozy golden light under the famous Aurora Borealis. There were glossy, full-spread pages of photos of students with their arms around each other, their smiles wide, eyes gleeful and excited. There were luxury hotel rooms, an all-you-can-eat breakfast buffet, a heated swimming pool both indoors and outdoors, and a chance to see the northern lights in the flesh. Seriously, this place looked incredible. I was taking a gap year before heading to college. I had two summers worth of savings, so a trip to Iceland, also known as the land of fire and ice, was a step in the right direction of finding myself and my identity after being cooped up with my mom for 18 years. I didn't question any of the red flags in front of me. So, in a way, maybe being in this situation is our fault. The plane ride was five hours, a pretty short flight, but I still managed to sleep for most of it, zonked out on anxiety meds mixed with Red Bull. The Final Destination movies had really screwed with my head. The guy sitting next to me with a thing for old school noir gave up his dog-eared copy of The Maltese Falcon. The cover was already giving me pretentious film student vibes. And watched the flight path on the screen in front of us. I was conscious for maybe 20 minutes in total on the flight. The first 10 minutes in the air, trying not to throw up from the pressure and pressing my face against the window, staring at the blur of white enveloping us, and then three or four hours in, when the pilots excitedly told us all to look out the windows, where we could just see the northern lights as the sky was starting to darken. That was when I realized my seatmate had personality, the way he was shaking me awake with his eyes and grinning lips like we were kids on Christmas morning. Hey! It took him nudging me maybe four times to spring me from my slumber, drool pooling down my chin my cheek uncomfortably pressed to the window. Ugh. Look! He shoved me again, and, still disoriented and kinda nauseous, I focused on where he was pointing, blinking rapidly. He didn't know my name, so the guy resorted to just repeatedly stabbing me with his index, hoping for the best. The rest of our group were freaking out, yelling, some of them crying. You would think the plane was crashing. And when my seatmate leaned over me, prodding the window, I followed his finger. The sky was a crystalline blue color that was bridging twilight, but I could still see them. I remember my stomach turning, Red Bull creeping back up my throat. We were so far up, almost in space, so far from home, so far from the ground, and yet I felt completely and totally at peace. I remember my seatmate shuffled closer to me, like he was trying to bond, trying to share an experience. The guy was older than me by a few years, early 20s. Between his mop of unruly brown curls and southern accent, he was cute in an endearing way. He smelled like sandalwood and fall leaves. His flickering breath in my face reeked of the mint candies he was chewing on. At that moment, we were both real and human, 
and witnessing a sight that was almost painful. The type of pain that stole the breath from your lungs. There they were, an intense, greenish blue illuminating the almost night. If I had a gun to my head and was forced to pick a favorite moment from this trip, I'd say watching the northern lights with a complete stranger, the two of us bouncing in our seats like two toddlers, was definitely a human moment I will never forget. Before everything went downhill, and our cozy trip to Iceland became something else entirely. I should have noticed things were shady from the get-go. The flight was just kids on the excursion. I thought it was a usual economy flight until my seatmate pointed out the lack of adults. We were supposed to land at Akareri Airport. It was the first stop on our carefully put together itinerary on the app, but the pilot insisted we were taking a detour due to weather patterns. When we finally landed, I noticed we were in the middle, and I mean the middle, of nowhere. The unnamed airport was empty, bar an American guy in his mid to late 20s with a two-eyed grin, holding a sign with, Hi, I'm Jake, your camp leader, it's nice to meet you, written in bubble writing, kinda juvenile. Camp? I shot my only friend, my seatmate who was still being stubborn about his name, a panicked look. His optimistic smile didn't waver. Winter camp, maybe? They'd probably call it something else here. Pulling my hood over my ears, I was shivering. But this place is empty. My unnamed seatmate shrugged, wrapping his arms around himself. It's got a KFC. He nodded at the familiar logo several feet away. See? We're fine. It's shut. I hissed out, ignoring his raised brow. Looking closer, the store looked almost abandoned. There was a notice on the door, but I couldn't read it. I don't think it was ever open. Well, it's winter. This guy had an answer for everything. Maybe it's shut for the season. It's mid-December. I wasn't convinced, tightening my clammy fingers around the handle of my suitcase. The only thing stopping me from going into panic mode was Kelly Clarkson's Under the Tree playing over the intercom. Now that I think about it, I think that was my splintering point. There was just us, a silent airport, and a Christmas song cackling over our heads. Yeah, but it's fried chicken. I had to raise my voice over the saxophone solo. I would understand an ice cream store being shut, but KFC? He snorted. Another song started up, a popular hit. This time I reveled in its familiarity. My seatmate nudged me to the catchy beat, and I almost stumbled off my feet. You're paranoid. Creepy, the brunette behind us muttered. A slight Scandinavian tinge to her accent. I could barely see the girl, a bright pink scarf wrapped around her neck and the bottom half of her face, light brown hair sticking from a knitted hat. She introduced herself as Aurora, to which my seatmate had responded with a grin. Yes, like the Borealis. Her parents were obsessed with the country, so the name felt right. I was thankful for Aurora's presence. According to my seatmate, Aurora was like a tour guide up until the detour, occasionally offering her skepticism. She had no idea where we were, and Aurora knew Northern Iceland like the back of her hand, thanks to her mom being born in Selfoss, a town further south. This was her eighth trip to Iceland, apparently, and she had never heard of or seen this place, which was concerning. I was already overwhelmed with the lack of people, the stark emptiness of the airport and the temperature already bleeding into my bones. I could see the night sky through a clear glass roof, inky oblivion with no stars, no moon, no light. Through the automatic doors at the exit was the same. Darkness that was impenetrable. Like this tiny airport in northern Iceland was completely cut off from the outside world. The others were already questioning our camp leader, who was definitely a frat boy in college. Jake reminded me of a surfer dude, or the lead love interest in a teen drama. He spoke with his hands, gesturing wildly like, Yo, yo, chill, it's all good, man. It's chill, bro. This guy had definitely been thoroughly trained to keep the peace. Ignoring questions like, where are we and why can't I get a signal, he successfully evaded the subject by promising exactly what was on the brochure, spewing the exact same shtick while landing us out into the dark, straight into snow up to our ankles. Jake, admittedly, did a great job of at least trying to keep up morale when the ice-cold chill slammed into us. What was advertised on the website? and on the itinerary was an Uber straight from Akareri Airport, but we weren't in Akareri. I had no idea where we were. I expected at least some signs of life, 
traffic on the roads, or maybe convenience stores. No. The roads were blocked with snow, and the sidewalk was black ice. There were no street lights, no traffic lights. I fell twice, almost taking my seatmate with me. In front of us was the dark, nothing but pooling oblivion, a vastness that was almost breathtaking. I wouldn't be able to differentiate the ground from the sky if it weren't for the snow. Aurora, for once, was not helping. She was making me more nervous, repeatedly telling us that this wasn't normal for there to be no streetlights, no sign of civilization in any direction I turned, my breath caught in wisps of white. When we boarded a rickety coach, she commented that her vast knowledge of Iceland ended right there. She had no idea where the hell we were or where we were going. When the bus only drove us further into the dark, down winding roads between snowdrifts, I couldn't resist speaking up. Until then, I had been relying on radwimps playing on 6% battery to loosen the knot in my gut. Where are we going? I demanded, leaning over in my seat. Jake's response was almost a knee-jerk reaction, his head whipping around, smile broadening. Don't worry, we'll be there soon, was all he said, like this guy was a stuck record or a confused robot. Now that I was really looking at him in the striking light bathing the bus, I was sure this guy wasn't blinking. His smile was too wide, almost eerily so. Why not look outside? You might be able to see the northern lights. He had repeated this over ten times. I stopped counting when we left the airport. Look outside, look at the northern lights, was all he said, occasionally commenting about how good the outdoor pool at the campsite was. Oh, so now it was a campsite. I tried to be positive, despite my slowly thinning sanity. I tried to think camp was another way of saying youth center. I even tried one last look outside, desperate to see anything. Anything that would give me hope we weren't being lured into a place of no return. But there was nothing. When I pressed my forehead against the frosty window, there was no light at the end of a seemingly endless tunnel under a suffocating sky. Only a slowly collapsing pinprick growing progressively more narrow. The only light was the illumination from the headlights splitting the road in half, and even they were starting to flicker out as we delved into nothing. Leaning back in my seat, I clung on for dear life as the bus flew over bumps in the road. I'm going to die, I thought, just as the bus slid sideways before righting itself. Jake, of course, was quick to settle our panic. This is going to be fun, I promised. He honked out a laugh when the bus flew over another bump, which sent my head smacking into the window. Stars in my eyes, not in the sky. My seatmate asked me if I was okay. His clammy fingers entangled with mine. He was shaking. Still didn't tell me his name. Jake's laugh grew raucous in my spinning head, my mind drifting into fog as the bus continued on, further and further into the void-like tunnel with no ending. Wait until you see the pool! I don't know if it's evident from the tone in my voice, I don't know if it comes across in writing, but there was no youth center retreat. There was no warm cabin, no heated pool, unless you count the hot spring that was just a hole in the ground, several feet away from me. It wasn't even a campsite. Jake was the only one with a tent, and his was more of a glamping luxury with a bed. When we asked where ours were, he spouted more crap about it being a fun survival exercise and we would be taken to the retreat the next morning. If you survive, he winked, before disappearing into his abnormally large tent. So, that left us fending for ourselves. Jake wasn't answering questions, or was answering questions with cryptic answers. We made a fire, which had taken us ten plus attempts due to the ice-cold wind blowing it out, and our slowly diminishing sanity. We did have the natural hot spring, and were taking turns dipping our toes in. I think it hit me when frostbite was starting to kick in, and I had stopped dragging myself to and from the hot spring to plunge my hands into our only source of heat. I was starting to lose track of time, trying to submerge more of myself into the water as the night went on and the temperature dropped. Aurora told me I was making it worse, so I slumped down on rock-hard ground, pulled my legs to my chest to conserve body heat, and allowed my dizzy thoughts to drift. It sounded like the perfect vacation. That's what I thought, drinking in each face in front of me our small huddle of shadows around a slowly dying fire. Sitting in minus temperatures directly under the northern lights sounds good on paper, 
or watching a TikTok wrapped up in bed. Those videos have all been perfectly edited to catch your eye. The Blue Lagoon, famous volcanoes and hot springs, the culture and food. But actually being in the raw, unedited footage they don't show, sitting on frozen ground in front of blurred oranges, your brain isn't sure is fire or the sun. Any heat being whipped away by the ice-cold wind chill, slowly freezing to death. And I mean all of you. Your bones and blood feel numb. Your skin doesn't feel like yours. And your thoughts are scattered between memories of home in hope that might come. Also, chocolate fudge sundaes. I was wrapped up in three coats. Aurora's lips were turning blue. The sky was oblivion above me. No stars. No northern lights. Conversations varied from fear that we were going to die, absolution that we were going to die, and then threats to kill Jake. We planned it all out. When we were still coherent, Penn had devised a plan to steal the guy's phone. We had all agreed and repeatedly said yes, we are going to do this, but I'm not sure how to describe the onset of hypothermia. Confusion. Penn said three times he was going to steal Jake's phone, but he was still sitting across from me, frowning at the fire. His head was cocked, and when I really concentrated, I could see icicles slowly spreading across his brow. I wasn't sure if I was seeing things, but after dazedly staring at my seatmate for a while, I realized I had imagined he had a name. Pen. He still wasn't giving me his real one, despite his hands and mine. I had a moment of clarity which was quickly suffocated by a chill that almost knocked me backwards. Wait, no, did he tell me his name? No, he definitely didn't. So, why was his name on my tongue? Pen. His jacket was over my shoulders, while Aurora's was hanging off of his. I had Nick's gloves and Nick was borrowing my sweatshirt. Ethan had one of my socks and Sonny was wearing my jeans. Does anyone else have any spooky s stories? Pen broke the silence, which was starting to sound like death itself. So quiet, and yet peaceful. His teeth were chattering, rubbing his hands together. Ten minutes earlier, he'd tried to stuff his hands into the fire. Nick stopped him. Just. I still didn't know his name. Penn's smile was the shell of his former self. No longer a wide grin bursting with optimism. It was more of a grimace, not even trying. I could see icicles forming under his nose, too. That was kind of worrying. Did hypothermia include turning into ice? I thought angling my head to see him better. No, I was probably hallucinating. Pressing my head into my lap, I exhaled breath into my hands. It was freezing cold, almost enough to snap me out of it. I was so damn cold and nothing was going to get better. I had half a mind to slice open my hand to feel the warmth of my own blood, but I couldn't bring myself to move. Moving was tiring and I just wanted to go to sleep. I I've got one, Nick mumbled into his knees. I thought he was asleep his body very slowly tipping into Ethan. Once upon a time, a group of people sued their psycho camp leader for abandoning them in the damn cold. Penn nodded slowly, his arms wrapped around his legs, chin resting on his knees. That was beautiful, truly poignant, Nick. I noticed Penn's voice was slurring a little. In the flicker of orange flame, I noticed his breath wasn't reacting with the cold air anymore. Strange. I remember rocking back and slamming back first down to the ground. I didn't move, closing my eyes until Aurora dragged me back into a sitting position. Stay awake, she told me. I tried, but it was hard, especially when I stopped feeling cold and suddenly I was all warm and toasty, ready to sleep. I was curling into a ball and burying my head between my arms when Penn once again stopped us from falling. Anyone else? I cracked one eye open. Aurora's eyes were flickering. Ethan's were closed. But he shook his head. Sonny wasn't moving. The blur of blonde curls and woolly hat that was the girl was curled up on her jacket. It looked like her body had already started to harden. I'm just resting my eyes, was what she said. Nobody commented that her lips were blue when she said that. When Sonny stopped responding, none of us really announced that she was dead. I had half a thought to maybe cover her up with something out of respect, but then I started thinking about hot fudge sundaes instead. Sure, I got a story. The British accent snapped me to fruition, like a nuclear bomb had gone off behind me. 
Lifting my head from where it had been uncomfortably lodged in my arms, I blinked. No, I definitely wasn't seeing things. There was a shadow looming over us. Two others in the corner of my eye, which didn't make any sense. We were completely alone, stuck in the middle of nowhere, so how could they be here? Sure, I would entertain the hallucination. The kid was our age, blondish brown curls and clad in a frozen letterman jacket hanging off of him. His face was too pale, like he was one with the snowflakes swirling around us. I focused on his friends, a guy with a shaved head and a tiny redhead in a blue and gold cheer skirt. Her clothes confused me. Who in their right mind would be wearing a cheer uniform? All three of them were barefoot. The British guy slumped onto the ground and held out his hands in front of the fire almost mockingly. I stared real hard at him before I remembered our fire blew out a while ago. Penn looked like he might speak, questioning why these three barefoot kids were in the middle of nowhere, but I don't think he could. Nick had slowly lifted his head, but I don't think he was fully conscious, only regarding them with a frown, eyes flickering, lips parted. The British guy cleared his throat. All right, are you guys ready to hear a spooky tale? He laughed when the redhead shoved him with a smile. They weren't cold. That's all I remember thinking. None of them were wearing coats or shoes, no thermal clothing to shield them from the cutting chills slicing into the air. There was once a group of campers who were abandoned by their head counselor. He caught himself, mocking a frown. Wait, no, that's you. Damn, sorry, let me start again. Sure, Penn was smiling, his head bowing. I kicked him to keep him awake. Alive. Okay, uh, so once there was a college football team. His smile faded, and I noticed how dark his eyes were. Two hollowed out holes in his head. The crest on his letterman jacket looked old. They were good, like, really good. Good enough to make it to the championships. This guy had a good storytelling voice, keeping us all awake with over-exaggerated voices and actions. But, unknown to them, their fates were sealed aboard their doomed flight. He cleared his throat. And what did their school do? Crap all. What did their town do? Nothing. His lips split into a grin. They didn't want the team to win. They wanted them to lose. So they covered it up? Sonny was speaking. Wait, no, Sonny was dead. That was my voice. The British guy nodded grimly. Bingo, do you want to guess where their doomed flight landed? He didn't wait for a response. Yep, you got it. Iceland. The middle of nowhere. The guy screwed up his face. I'm talking about the parts of Iceland that haven't been discovered yet. They did find help eventually and promise of shelter, a youth retreat with a steaming pool both inside and outside. I was slowly taking in his words. They were kind of familiar. The boy leaned back, running his hand through his hair. First, he paused for effect. They had to survive the bitter chill of night, and come morning they would be taken to safety. The boy held his finger to his lips, but they came to realize that being left out to freeze was just the beginning of adaptation. He jumped up, circling around the group. One by one, they started to succumb to the cold. His voice grew louder. But this wasn't the usual cold, man. This is the type of cold that becomes part of you. He stepped in front of Penn, reached out, and poked the boy in the face. The leader was first, he mocked. He was so tired. Tired of having hope. Tired of trying to keep himself alive. I started to wonder if this guy was more than a hallucination. When he moved, the snow seemed to dance with him. Others followed, he continued, all of them dropping one by one, breath by breath, until only one was left standing. He crouched beside Sunny, traced his fingers across her cheek. But they didn't die. The British guy's tone hardened. I noticed his friends looked uncomfortable. They weren't allowed to die, he spat, straightening up. Soon they were out of the cold, escaping death by a surgeon's hand. The redhead jumped to her feet, motioning for them to go, but he continued. Now, prisoners and reluctant test subjects of a mad scientist trying to turn fantasy into reality, they were no longer human. Their thoughts filled with cravings they didn't understand. I nodded slowly. And did it work? I asked through numb lips. Did the mad scientist succeed? He caught my eye, 
Sort of, he said. First, they shined bright. Truly, they were the epitome of what he was trying to make. However, humans aren't cut out for that kind of change to their anatomy. The mad scientist watched in horror as each of his shining stars failed, bleeding out on the surgical table. He incinerated their bodies and continued his experiments on unsuspecting students. His lips split into a grin, sharpened in scissors resembling fangs. I remember wondering how he was doing that thing with his face. Like that was impressive, even for hypothermia-induced hallucinations. There was something coming alive in his face, inky darkness spiderwebbing under his eyes, bleeding into his iris. But, he caught my eye with a grin, then pens. We were the only ones awake, alive. His first subjects were the start of it because they... He tipped his head back and blew a raspberry. Nick dropped dead at that moment, his body slamming into the ground with a meaty smack. The British guy barely noticed. Well, I guess they were the start of something, even if that led to failure. Huh. Good story. I wanted to clap, but my hands weren't moving. None of me was moving. The guy mocked a bow when his friends dragged him back, elongated fangs folding back into his mouth. The end. I think I passed out once the words left his mouth. No, I was still awake. I could hear the crunch of his toes in the snow. I felt my body hit the icy ground this time. I didn't feel the need to get up or open my eyes, but when the crunch of his footsteps collapsed into white noise in my skull, I forced my eyes open. The standout gold in his jacket was startling against the backdrop of snow. There were smears of red where there shouldn't have been, tears and stains I didn't notice. Or maybe I didn't want to notice them. The more I looked at his fading shadow, I wondered if he was real. And when my gaze lazily found the back of his head, the bleeding black crater-sized cavern carved in the back of his skull, I knew. Sorry. I'm okay. I'm sorry. It was a long time before he spoke again. But then my ankles were being violently tugged. I was flying. I was in someone's arms, clinging to the heat their body was giving off. My head was hanging at an odd angle. I remember they dropped me. I hit something hard and I was seeing shapes. Still no stars or northern lights. For what? This time the red-headed girl was standing over me. Her eyes were sad. When the smooth metal of something was pressed into the flesh of my temple, my body jerking to the side, I asked again. For what? But I couldn't move my lips. The passage of time seemed to speed up. One minute I was lying in snow, a baggage of figures hanging over me, ghost football players in the backs of my eyes, and the next I was lying directly under blinding light. I wasn't cold anymore, the shadow collapsing onto a figure moving in snapshots of consciousness as I bled in and out. I counted consciousness in the light fixtures. Every time they flicked, I knew I was awake. Blink. My brain was burning, my body was alight, and I was shaking jerking side to side violently. A gloved hand held me in place. Blink. I was screaming, a deep, raw cry ripping from my throat. I could feel the teeth of a blade cutting me open. Blink. Lemonade was forced through my lips. Then hot cocoa. Then coke. Pepsi. Hot fudge sundae. When they were blinking on and off, erratic, while my body was forced onto my side, then my stomach and back, I was guzzling soda that tasted a little too thick. Then a sharp prick in my neck, something slid into my vein. Whoever this person was, they took their time drawing my blood, as if reveling in it. When the lights flickered for the last time, I caught it perfectly. A single flash in my vision. Light that had shadows to it. Light that was made of dust. And light that she colored. I was sitting up, primed on my toes. Something warm and slithery squelching between my fingers. There was frost on my fingers, tiny shards of ice pushing through my skin and spreading at the back of my throat. Another prick, and I was falling. I woke up more coherent, my wrists strapped down, this time dazedly watching a gurney squealing past me. The blankets covering the body were stained an odd shade I had never seen before. Red had never looked so good like I could reach out and drain it from the blanket by sucking away every stain. I didn't realize I was fighting my restraints, trying to claw for the bloody blanket, when a mangled arm slipped from the table. The beaded bracelet 
he had been wearing, the stupid thing jingling like crazy when he was trying to wake me up to watch the northern lights. I still didn't know his name. I watched suited figures, and figures in white, haul the boy into their arms and throw onto an incinerator. Aurora followed. I could see locks of her hair, then Sonny, Nick. I watched all of them shoved through cruel metal doors. I don't think I cried. Maybe I did, but I think I forgot how to. A week after I saw them burn, I was let go to get comfortable with my surroundings. I tried to kill my creator, but he can't seem to die, but he does give me food. Yesterday, I found Pen, inside a giant glass box. The guy's eyes were a strange color, almost tendril-like darkness spiderwebbing under his eyes. When he saw me, he opened his mouth and smiled, and then ripped the head off a bunny rabbit hopping around his cage. I told him with my eyes that I will get us out of here, but looking outside, there is just sky and snow. The sky is two colors, pitch black and crystalline blue. There are no northern lights. The location is hidden when I check. There's just a large patch of white. Can someone tell me where we are? And if you find us, can you help us get out? I promise I'm not a monster. I just want to go home. That's the end of the story. I really hope you enjoyed it. A huge shout out to Trash Tia for allowing me to read such an extravagantly written story. And a shout out to you for listening. I really do appreciate you stopping by and checking in this uh, video or episode out. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you do, I'd love to know. Leave a comment wherever you can or like the video, podcast episode, whatever you got. And uh, if you'd like to come hang out and say hi, we do have a Discord you can come join. It's pretty low key. You'll get some warm welcomes. But with all that said, I really hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you in the next one.